I grew up in the UK and we emigrated here when I was 14 and then I, I, we emigrated to Frankston in Victoria. I uh, did my, a couple of years of high school down there and uh, with the intention of eventually joining the army but I was 16 so I was still a bit too young. Um, so I had a couple of other jobs, apprentice motor mechanic etc. When I was 19 I, uh, I ended up joining the army. I, I had been in the army cadets in the UK, uh, an artillery regiment, so that sort of basically set the scene for me. I was born in Wales, South Wales, uh, and then we relocated to Sheffield in preparation for coming to Australia. So I came out here with quite a broad Sheffield accent, but uh, because uh, poms weren't the flavour of the month, I worked very hard to get rid of it. I'd been in the Army Cadets and I really, I knew that Army life was something that I would really like to be part of, uh, part of. Um, but also uh, because we were new to Australia, I, I sort of wanted to be, to prove myself to the country and, and gain some acceptance from the country. So I felt as though I'd actually earned the right to be here. I actually joined to go to Vietnam. Uh, I wanted to. That's. I wanted to prove myself to be worthy of living in Australia. I knew a little bit about it because of the the climate at that time. You know, the political situation and uh, everything that was going on with the moratoriums, what have you. Um, I didn't know a great deal about it. I'm not quite sure I even knew where Vietnam was, to be honest. But uh, it was something that um, I just wanted to be a, a part of. I sort of knew what to expect. Um, I didn't go, I, I went in with my eyes wide open, but uh, I guess the biggest shock for me was that um, uh, I'd been playing in rock bands for a couple of, couple of years and I had long hair, and uh, the biggest shock was having to get my hair cut short. But apart from that, uh, no, I took to it really quite well. I uh, teamed up with uh, a great group of guys um, we all went through recruit training and core training together, and um, they're still my best mates. It was a good three months worth of very physical, um, long days, late nights, early mornings, and um, thoroughly enjoyable. I mean, I really enjoyed it. It was uh, I came out out of there really, really fit. Uh, I managed to stay out of trouble whilst I was in there, so I didn't have to do too many uh, later nights than I needed to. Um, and as I said, the, the, the guys I went through with, uh, most of them are still good friends of mine, so um, it made it a lot easier having that support structure, you know, even though we, well, and we sort of relied on each other as you, as you do in the Army anyway. So it was, uh, it was a great, great time in my life and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. From Kapuka I went to the School of Artillery at North Head in Manly to uh, do my core training. Then went to uh, Holsworthy and I was there, we were, we, when we came out of uh, recruit training and out of, then out of core training, the, the battery had, 104 battery had just come back from Vietnam uh, probably six months earlier and it was just rebuilding so we were pretty much the first guys to be in the, in the new newly formed uh, or restructured battery. Uh, to be honest I can't remember who we replaced. Uh, so I was actually a, I was attached to an infantry battalion to, to four RA so um, I didn't have a great deal to do with the, the gunners as such uh, because I was more involved with the, with the infantry side of things. I was a, a signaller. I did my signal training uh, as an artillery signaller, and um, when I completed that, they, uh, I was then promoted to a bombardier, and I became the battery commander signaller. So he, the, the battery commander, works very closely with the uh, the battalion CO uh, in, in terms of uh, what uh, artillery requirements they they need, and so. 
I was his signal, so everywhere he went, I would go with him um, out on uh, missions, and we spent a, a lot of time out the bush um, before we went to Vietnam and in Vietnam. I actually went over with the regiment. We we weren't we travelled as a, as a unit, but it was we all had our own jobs once we got there. Um, the briefing that we got was uh, was fairly intense, but it was it was actually not a a one-off briefing. It was we were in Townsville for 14 months prior to going over to to Vietnam, where we did a lot of uh, training up at high range, and that's when we were actually work, working in our roles that we were doing in Vietnam. So the briefing sort of took place more in terms of on-the-job training rather than saying this is what you'll be doing, even though we were told that initially. But it was just a brief uh, um, overview. Uh, initially, and then once we started doing the uh, performing the roles in Australia, we were we found out what exactly what we were doing over in Vietnam. When we got out at Tonson Ut, out of the 707, it was like wall walking into a, a furnace for a start. It was really, really hot and humid. Um, there were, it was a military air base, obviously, and a lot of aircraft activity. Uh, then we flew from Tonson to Nui Dat in a C-131. My first impression was, I remember we were coming in to land at Nui Dat and we took fire so we had to, they had to go around and have another try. So then we, when we landed uh, we were disembarked and taken straight to our um, new home in a tent. Well it was four men to a tent. It, it was great. I mean it was uh, well, it was what I expected it to be. It was uh, a lot of a lot of fun whilst we were in the base, um, but when we went out the bush, it was all hard work, you know. So it was. Um, I mean, it wasn't all. None of us knew what to expect. Obviously, going to a war, you don't really know what you're in for. But um, we we sort of. I think we were all on edge, but trying to make put on a, a brave front in front of our peers so that we didn't appear to be um, terrified. They give you, like, I think, seven days to acclimatise um, and prepare your, your gear to go out bush and uh, then then you go out. So I wasn't actually out on patrol as such with, with the infantry because I was co-located co -located with battalion headquarters. Uh, but we did go out on... Um, patrols from from the bases we were at, uh, you know, clearing clearing patrols at night time to make sure that there was no one there going to try and get into our camp. The battery commander used to go to, to our fire support bases and I'd go with him, uh, not all the time but quite often. Be going out in the morning, um, the, the battery commander would meet with the gun position officer and uh, the uh, section commanders and I'd just uh, catch up with some of my mates from the off the guns uh, and then we'd, we'd go back. If, if it was a, a fair way out, we'd go in by chopper. It's, it's fantastic. I mean, I, I love flying and um, in, in a war zone, like the, it's obviously a lot, lot different to flying in a helicopter here in Australia, we've got all the guidelines. Uh, we'd sit in a Huey with our legs hanging out the side, no seat belts, you know, full pack weapon, ready to disembark as soon as it landed. Uh, but they fly really low across the ground, so you know they're not a, a target high in the air. And um, yeah, it was it was really quite amazing flying along river banks and banking in and out. And, Well, if we're in New Dat, it would mean that we're off operation. So it, it was that was when you got a little bit of time to relax. So you'd probably spend we spent a lot of our time cleaning up our gear from being out in the bush. You might be out there for three weeks at a time, um, just clean up your gear, uh, relaxing. Uh, we had the opportunity sometimes to go down to Vung Tau, uh, although I only went down there once for an R and C weekend. And then guys would um, go to the American PX, and buy some something for family or you know a souvenir for yourself or something, 
and um, then spend a bit of time, you know, with that. Uh, a couple of guys bought nice big Akai tape recorders and big radios and things. So, yeah, just spent a lot of time messing around with those and, and sort of working out all this new technology, which reel-to-reel -reel tape was new technology back then. Yeah, you know, I had a yeah. small, a small Philips um, reel-to-reel, -reel, which I just made tapes and sent home to family. Well, I was married at the time. I, I was just newly married, so I was sending them to my wife. So um, she probably she probably played them for the family, but they may not. They weren't actually sent to them directly. I'm probably like most other guys. I, I, you don't really want your mum and particularly your mother to be really worried, so you tend to sort of not mention anything too much about what's going on. It's um, just about how you are more than anything and hoping everything was all right at home and you're both well and what have you. Um, I'd probably mention a bit more to my wife at that time about what was going on, but, um, yeah, I'd, I think sort of shield your parents a bit from some of the reality. Because I'd been in bands, I, I played a bit of guitar, so we'd just sit around at night and sing songs and have a couple of beers, which were only like 10 cents a can. <laughs> so it was, um, it was nice to, to have that. You could only have a, a couple, and we were normally only in, in Nui Dat for two or three days at a time, so um, it wasn't enough time to get sick of any of that stuff. We were at different bases, uh, but the main one that we were at was uh, a place called Courtney Hill, which is um, part of the Courtney rubber plantation. Um, it's on Route 2, just north of... It's actually on the border of Phuc Thuy and Long Khan provinces. At night time, or just before dark, they'd uh, assign a patrol to go out and just clear a quadrant of, of the area, so there'd be four patrols going out, each doing a patrol out to about 150 metres, just to make sure there was no one in there lying in wait to to cause a problem during the night. Yeah, you just you just move through very carefully and slowly, and uh, make sure you don't trap, step on a a booby trap somewhere, which we never actually we never actually found any but um, you always get wary of them. Once they established Courtney Hill that became basically our centre of operations from there um, but we before Courtney Hill was established we, we went to other areas uh, to other bases and uh, but we tended not to stay there for you know more than a couple of days um, then we go back to Nui Dat and then when Courtney Hill was established that was basically our, our base outside Nui Dat. We had um, Charlie Battery from some from an American regiment attached to uh, to at, at one of our fire support bases. I think it was fire, fire support base Cherie. Um, so we had they had 105, 155 millimeter uh, guns, and we had 105s. Uh, and it, I, it could have been Operation Nui Lay. Um, Oh, sorry, the Battle of Nui Lai, Operation Ivanhoe, but um, yeah, that was that was probably the biggest battle we had whilst we were there, and I, I'm pretty sure that's when we had the Americans attached to us. They were great blokes. Um, I mean, the, everyone got along really well, but they're very loud, uh, whereas we'd sort of try to maintain a low profile. The Americans weren't, weren't too shy about sort of making themselves known. So... Uh, in terms of the way they operate as, as artillerymen, uh, it's all very similar from what I remember anyway. As I say, I wasn't with the guns, but um, from what I've, what I've heard from the, my mates who were on the guns, uh, it, was very, it was just like working with Australians as far as the actual artillery support goes. Uh, well, I went there once on RNC, which is just a weekend away from the the front, or the front, I guess that's what you can call it, but, um, and then 
we, we spent three weeks there when we were drawn from Nui Dat. Um, but Vung Tao was, it was a very vibrant place, a game very loud and uh, particularly when you've been out the bush for two or three weeks and everything's really silent. You come in sort of Lambretta scooters and everything going everywhere and people, yeah, it, it was, it was a, I quite liked uh, Vung Tao myself. Um, it was, because it was so hot and humid there, uh, had a distinct smell about it. Um, but um, you got sort of used to that after a few hours. You know. We were in a fairly protected area within Vung Tau. Uh, we were in a place called Camp 500, which was, we were co-located with um, Vietnamese, uh, South Vietnamese uh, troops. So they were in a different section of it. It was all fenced off, but um, yeah, it was, it was a, actually a time of sort of uh, sort of really settling down after after being hardly tense for the last six months, you know. It was actually a lot of fun for the first week, couple of weeks in there because, uh, well, we're now out of the out of the operational area and uh, hopefully in a safe area and we could um, really just let our hair down and relax a little bit. We didn't have a lot to do with the locals. Um, we were we were sort of kept in in our area uh, which was quite a large area but um, I, I didn't have I didn't maybe some of the officers and that did have more to do with the locals from a, a liaison perspective but um, uh, even if we had I don't know if I don't know what the uh, the English ability was anyway um, so I, 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 I never actually spoke to any of the locals about how they felt about the Australians leaving and it's only since, you know, since we came home that you sort of, uh, I've read a lot about it and uh, particularly after the Saigon fell, they, um, there was a lot of resentment. They felt that we, the Americans in particular had let them down, uh, but the Australians to a certain extent had too. The Badco Club was really, it was a nice area because it was right on the beach. Um, you could go for a swim in safety, or relative safety anyway, or safe you can be on a beach. They had nice facilities there, and it was, there would never be, not when we were there anyway, there weren't, it wasn't packed with, with um, servicemen on, on rest and recreation leave or anything, so it was just uh, a nice couple of days. We had a, had a weekend there, about half a dozen of us, um, just taken out of the field for a couple of days and uh, went down there and great facilities, uh, all air conditioned at rooms and everything. It was just, uh, it was nice to have that little bit of luxury for, for a couple of days. Oh, we always, we got along, and there was never any tension with them, within my group anyway. Uh, we, I think we had a, we had a common goal and a common fear, so we tended to sort of look outwards rather than looking inwards, um, and not not focus so much on what our guys were doing that might upset you under normal circumstances. You sort of more focused on what the people out there that that may be out there wanted to um, to do to you. I came back home to Sydney. It was about 10 days, yeah. It was great. Um, like the, the uh, accommodation, very cramped in, in hammocks. and um, But it was, it was great. We could wander around the ship and uh, we had a lot of exercises, PT every day. And um, they occasionally would get the rifles out and they'd put targets out in the water and we'd just shoot at them and you know, give, give us something to do for a couple of hours uh, and then the rest of the time we just spend sitting around in the sun um, waiting to get home. We had no formal debrief really as, as such. Uh, we, we did have like the our regimental CO, our CO addressed us um, and sort of gave us a bit of a debrief of what we'd achieve, we'd achieve whilst we'd been there but um, that time just allowed you to go over in your mind what you know what 
where you'd been for the last seven or eight months and um, to debrief yourself in, in, in real terms. I think all of us felt that um, uh, and the National Servicemen as much as uh, my, myself and the other regular soldiers because we we'd sort of psyched ourselves up for a 12 month uh, tour and it was cut short to eight months so it was uh, we felt as though we hadn't done our job really you know so that was that was sort of a, a, a real disappointment for me anyway it was. Disembarked the Sydney on Christmas Eve of 1971, um, and they disembarked us at midnight. And we were sort of uh, we went on leave then for about six weeks. Um, I stayed with my cousin who lived in Sydney at the time, and then um, I, I think they flew me to Melbourne the following day to be with my family. So. Um, it was it was uneventful, uh, and we all all the guys from the from the battery sort of said goodbye to each other. We'd see each other in you know six weeks or however long. And I'm, I must admit, I think my family were were really supportive uh, of me, which made a difference. And I th I think um, a, a lot of guys came home and didn't have that support, and it made them feel as though they'd been sort of ostracised and put in a, a different category. Uh, I know some of them did come home with a lot of uh, mental issues uh, and uh, particularly the National Servicemen, as you say, felt that more than we did as regular soldiers. Because I had, I had that security of knowing that I was going back there in six weeks or whatever to sort of pick up my career again. Uh, and a lot of the Nashos, although I must admit the Nashos I served with, and I think they're fairly typical of all Nashos, they were very flexible and accommodating. I think um, it's the ones that probably had a lot worse um, encounters over there than we did that, uh, that really felt it. You know, people like the guys at Long Tan and uh, those events. I think I'm I'm a bit fortunate that I, I've, when, when, when I came home and got off the Sydney and event, went to, back to Melbourne, I just pulled the shutter down on the whole thing. So I resume, I just picked up my life where I'd left it before I went overseas. And uh, I've never had any um, bad effect from that. So I, I, I mean, I think about Vietnam and I, uh, I was diagnosed with PTSD from it, but um, I've never let it worry me. It's uh, just something that I've compa compartmentalised, and that was a part of my life that, whilst I was in a war zone, it was it wasn't something that I came back from with any any sort of um, serious side effect or um, anything that I felt had uh, affected me negatively. When I went over, I, we had a son that was six months old when I went over, so seeing him at you know, 14, 15 months or something, was, um, that, was, that was fantastic. Because at six months, he probably wouldn't have remembered me, um, even though uh, he probably saw photographs of me all the time. Because my, my wife and my son were, were living with my parents whilst I was over there. So they were getting letters, and I was sending, I'd send the occasional photograph uh, and we had photographs from when I, before I went over, so um, he would have seen photographs of me, but perhaps not known who I was. And my parents and my wife got on really well, so there was, there was no problem there. And having, having the baby, of course, was, uh, that kept her pretty busy, I should imagine, whilst I was away. Um, but we did keep in, in regular contact, uh, as regular as we could back then. Um, there were no mobile phone calls or anything, or FaceTime or Zoom meetings or anything, but um, yeah, it was, I, I think, I think she, she struggled to a certain extent because she was by herself with 
someone other than her own family, but her own family weren't that far away anyway. They were, not, they were only probably maybe 15 k's away. So she did spend a fair bit of time with them as well. It was something that I wanted to do, it was something I did, and uh, I mean, there's no one else to blame for have, me having gone, been over there than, than myself. But um, in terms of whether we should have been there or not, uh, there's a lot of, it's a contentious point. Uh, when, one of the things that drove me to actually want to go to Vietnam was uh, like the domino theory. Uh, if, if we didn't go to help, then uh, the communist threat could uh, spread throughout Southeast Asia and, and eventually end up uh, being potentially uh, a threat to, to Australia. So that was part of the driver for me to go over to do my bit to make sure that that didn't happen. Um, but as far as I, I, I've read a lot of books about Vietnam since I came home, and I'm, I'm still of the opinion that we did the right thing because we were like supporting our allies, and that's what Australia always does. I actually had a pet monkey for a few days. Um, he used to sit on my pack whilst we were walking around and he would sit him in the gun pit with me at night on when I was on gun picket and we used to the, in the ration packs used to get these uh, cans of bread and I'd open one of these for him he'd sit on my knee and he'd eat away at it whilst uh, whilst we were sharing the gun pit he just appeared one day and came and sort of sat on on my pack and stayed with me for a few days and then obviously found something better to do. Well, he wasn't afraid of me at all. I, I don't know if, he was, if he'd been someone else's pet monkey and he might have just been doing the rounds, I don't know. I, I'm of the firm opinion that Anzac Day is, is the day that, um, well, it's probably been proven that Australia actually became a nation. Uh, and I've tried to do my best as long as with other army um, members that to, to make sure that, that tradition's continued.